Yeah, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, nonlinear regression. So, so far we've been fitting a line to our points. We have a set of points. We've been asking what the least squares fit is to that so that we can estimate beta, which is our underlying uh, slope for our parametric fit. Okay, but there are certain times when <clears throat> that relationship will not be linear, when our biological data and our biologically parametric relationship underlying the relationship of y to x is not a linear one. So I wanted to give you some examples of when that might be. And then what kinds of uh, equations can we fit? The first set of equations we can fit are called polynomial uh, equations, and we have in fact, line, a line is a polynomial to uh, degree 1, um, but we can have a second order polynomial by adding an x squared term. We can have a third order polynomial by adding a x cubed term, etc. Okay, so we could have very much higher order polynomials and we would see different shapes of relationships then between x and y that are possible. In every case, our statistics software is estimating um, b, the estimate of beta, c, the estimate of gamma, d, the estimate of um, delta, perhaps, uh, so for our Greek letters representing the parametric values. Okay, so um, the fitting engine is basically the same, though. We use least square regression. To try to fit um, a curve to the particular set of points we have. So what kinds of examples could we have of this? Um, one of these might involve uh, natural selection itself. When we have fitness as our y-axis and x uh, some trait as our x-axis, um, we can characterize natural selection through regression. And in fact, we've already talked about linear regression, and if the relationship was linear, we fit a line and this beta estimate was significantly different from zero, we could say we have directional selection. So nonlinear selection would come in where the relationship is not a straight line, where in fact there's curvilinearity to it. So what might that look like? Well, we might have, for example, low values of fitness at low values of the trait, and that might go up to some optimum, and then we have low values of fitness at high values of the traits. Okay, so what would a fitted line look like there. It would maybe look like a parabola, okay? And so we could fit that with a polynomial regression. We would get a significant negative value of C, a significant curve of linearity here, where the high values of X, remember this is the coefficient of CX squared in our equation, and if C is negative, as soon as X gets large, this whole term is going to draw fitness back down. And so we might have this shape relationship where we have a positive B value. It goes up at the beginning, but eventually it comes down. Okay, so this would be what? Stabilizing selection. Cool. What about the opposite pattern? If we had X versus fitness and the middle values had the lowest values of fitness and the extremes had relatively high fitness, we could also fit a parabola here, a second order polynomial, but we would have a positive value of C, and we would have what's called disruptive selection. Now, just because we have selection doesn't mean we have evolution. We would need to have some heritable variation in the trait that would give rise to change in frequencies of genes over time, um, but the patterns of selection um, we could quantify by using nonlinear regression. Okay, so that's one really important example. By the way, uh, this whole approach to quantifying selection was really beautifully outlined by 
famous paper by Landay and Arnold in the Chicago School of Quantitative Genetics in 1983. I'll look that up. Highly cited paper. Okay, second kind of use of nonlinear regression is the study of allometric relationships. And allometric relationships are just mathematical quantities relating, for example, two traits to each other. It doesn't have to be just two, it could be more than two, but um, we're going to talk about two here, and we're going to just talk about describing those relationships. So, for example, um, they may well be nonlinear, they often are, and we could do a linear regression of LNY regressed on X. Okay, so how does that help? Well, we would have the natural log of Y, and we would get coefficients for the intercept and for the slope. And we could do a little bit of mathematical rearrangement here. Okay. We could say let C equal E to the A, because E is a constant, A is a constant. So Y would equal C uh, E to the BX. Okay, so this is our allometric relationship. It's an allometric equation relating X to Y. And if, for example, it was very easy to measure X, we could extrapolate from this equation, depending upon our fit, of course, if we had a really nice fit, we could make a prediction of what y could be without actually having to measure it. So this would be really convenient, for example, if you could measure the weight of an organism and then predict its surface area based upon that weight, and then you needed the surface area in a model, for example, of, I don't know, heat loss from the body of that organism, maybe therefore stress. Um, okay, another example would be where we plot the log of y versus the log of x. Okay, and we get a linear equation for that too. So we get a plus b log y. All right, so then we get, um, we, we get the, we let a equal uh, the log of c. Okay, so we have I'm going to change these to lowercase n now, sorry. Log of c plus b log of y uh, of x, sorry, x, there we go. All right, and then we have um, log of y equals log c plus b log x, and we would see that then log of y equals log of c times x to the b power. And we could see by inspection here that therefore y equals c times x to the b. All right, so we have a beautiful allometric equation that we derived from a linear regression of log of y on the log of x. And that's a very common function um, relating um, two traits to one another in an allometric fashion. Okay, um, let's talk about a couple more examples. If we have, um, in biology, if we want to do experimental studies of causation, very important aspect, um, we might vary something quantitatively and then look at how some Y variable responds to that. Now you might say, well, why wouldn't we just do an ANOVA? So for example, if you're interested in the effects of UV radiation, we chose 0, 10, 20, 30% ozone depletion in the atmosphere as our levels. You might say, well, why not just um, do an ANOVA, right? So we have some response of flavonoids or something as our Y variable, and we're seeing whether it responds to uh, ozone depletion, why not just do that as an ANOVA? Well, there are actually certain advantages because these are a continuous variable, they are ordered. Now, ANOVA doesn't know that zero is less than 10, is less than 20, is less than 30, but with regression, we do have that quantity 
in the estimation of the effect. And in fact, we're estimating only one parameter, so we have a little more power to detect change than we do with ANOVA. So there's some nice articles about how uh, regression can actually be more powerful than ANOVA to detect certain kinds of effects. Okay, so, so we might vary UV or we might vary temperature. And this is often, you know, temperature often have optima for different kinds of curves. For example, photosynthetic rate, um, there tends to be an optimum temperature for photosynthesis. And so we could quantify that by varying temperature systematically and looking at the response of photosynthesis and get the shape of that curve rather than just do an ANOVA showing, showing that shape. And we, could, we could fit a curve and, and rather reasonably we could extrapolate what the values in between might be. Whereas before, when we talked about like low, medium, high levels, one of the reasons we didn't want to draw things as a line when we were showing ANOVA results was we don't know the values in between. But if we actually have um, chosen values of temperature that are separated in a reasonable way, we actually can extrapolate what the values might be in between. Even if we haven't measured them, it's fairly reasonable to assume it's following a curve of some kind. Whereas with ANOVA, um, you know, we haven't measured anything in between, and so really drawing it that way is um, could be a little bit deceptive. Okay, so varying things continuously. And by the way, some nice experimental designs can be done to um, uh, to accommodate this. So for example, if this is UV lamp banks and you're growing plants underneath UV lamp banks, putting them on a slant, you can grow the plants like this and they'll get almost a continuous level of exposure from low at the left end to high at the right end, which you can quantify, right? And so we can really get a nice axis of our X effect. So rather than put the experiment on benches where we just have, you know, discrete heights of the benches, why not put it on a slant and get more continuous values of our variable? It might, it might get more power to uh, detect uh, change or response in that kind of a experimental set setup. Okay, another example is actually discovering um, scientific laws Um, you know, using the word law is always a little bit dicey, but um, one of the laws in plant ecology is called the minus three halves thinning law, and it's been disputed a lot. There've been a lot of a lot of publications on whether it's real or not, but basically, it's the a plot of the log of the mean plant size. Excuse me. Versus uh, log of plant density. So, you know, it's kind of common understanding that if you plant a lot of things close together, they'll be very small, but if you give them lots of space, they'll get very big, and that's due to the plasticity of plant growth and so forth. Um, but it was discovered by basically statistical fitting that this follows a particular pattern, which is pretty repeatable um, with a what looked like <laughs> a slope of minus three halves. Now it turns out there's a lot of dispute over this. It might be minus four thirds. It might be something else altogether. It might be that on part of the curve, but not on all of the curve. Um, nevertheless, um, in, in fact, for about 25 years in ecology, it was assumed that the minus three halves thinning rule held pretty well across everything from oh, small annual plants up to redwood trees. So, it, you know, it was almost a universal law, and then it kind of got um, attacked because people looked more closely at the uh, regression fitting, and so later on the, the coefficient was revised downwards, and then it was revised again and revised again. I think there's still controversy about this. I can't get too caught up in it, but it was discovered through statistical fitting of a log mean plant size versus log density plot. All right. Um, I've mentioned this one before, I think, but, you know, if you're doing some kind of a calibration curve um, or you want to predict 
x knowing y predict y knowing x might be smarter huh uh, then then you can also do curve fitting and, and the curve fitting is not necessarily a straight line certainly calibration curves can be um, curves instead of um, make them look like this instead of looking like a straight line and so we can predict y knowing x and the prediction gets a little dicier as we get to the flatter part of the curve, right? So we would want to know that, and we want to fit the appropriate curve to that. Okay, um, I think that's all I'm going to talk about right now in terms of nonlinear fitting. Um, there are lots more examples in biology of people using nonlinear fits. Um, most statistics packages, including SAS Jump, will have plenty of opportunities um, to fit things non-linearly. You can even go to spline fitting and other kinds of fitting engines um, that will give you very nice fits for relating two variables to each other and getting an equation that matches that relationship. Okay.